Hi, everyone. Um, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Kat Lloyd. I'm with the Education Department at the Tenement Museum. I am so glad that you've joined us today for our program in partnership with the African Burial Ground National Monument. Um, I'm joined today by my colleagues Eliza Rasmussen and Brenda Brandini, um, who will introduce themselves now. Hi, my name is Eliza Rasmussen. I'm one of the park rangers of the African Burial Ground, and we're very excited to be here with the Tenement Museum for this joint program today. And we're glad you could all join us. Hello, my name is Brenda Brandini, and I'm honored to serve as a park ranger at the African Burial Ground National Monument. So welcome again to all of you, wherever you may be tuning in from. Um, today's program, we're going to look at stories of the African family experience um, in New Amsterdam. And we'll share some stories from the Tenant Museum's research, um, some stories from the African Burial Ground National Monuments research. And we really hope to hear from you um, throughout this program. So please feel free to chime in in the chat with your questions, your thoughts, your comments, connections. Um, we really hope to, to hear from you throughout. So our program will explore some stories of what we can learn um, about the African ex family experience and really experiences in early New Amsterdam. And this program um, is in celebration of Black History Month. Um, so we can take time to really recognize the depth and the centrality of Black history um, to the land that we now know as New York City. So recognizing that Black History Month um, should be more than a month and that we can really take time um, throughout the year to look at stories of Black and African American experiences. Now, um, for those of you who might be familiar with the Tenerent Museum, um, you may know that New Amsterdam is usually much earlier history than the Tenerent Museum normally shares. Um, for those of you who may be less familiar with the Tenerent Museum, I will um, just share a little bit about what we do. So these two buildings are 97 and 103 Orchard Street, um, and they house the Tenement Museum. Um, we are located in these two historic tenement buildings um, on Manhattan's Lower East Side, um, sort of Orchard and Delancey Streets. And um, you know, these two buildings are both five stories, um, and, and they were really apartment buildings, right? Um, homes to families from the mid 19th century through the end of the 20th century. So at the Tenement Museum, um, we tell the stories of the people who lived in these buildings, but really much more broadly, we tell the stories of migration, of belonging, of identity. Um, most of the people who lived in these buildings were uh, migrants or the children of migrants. And so we really look to understand the stories of ordinary people in shaping our city and our country. And a lot of people associate the Lower East Side neighborhood where we're, we're located um, with early periods of European migration, um, the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th centuries. But um, the Tenant Museum has really recently been undergoing um, you know, deeper exploration of um, you know, who else has lived in um, the Lower East Side um, you know, before the history that we, we generally tell at the Tenement Museum. And in particular, looking at um, you know, stories of Black and African American history, not just in the Lower East Side, but more broadly in Lower Manhattan, um, to really understand how um, the Lower East Side has been shaped by different people um, really through the period um, as early as New Amsterdam. So this work, which will be featured soon um, on an upcoming virtual tour and eventually walking tour, um, has brought us into partnership with the um, African Burial Ground National Monument, um, where we can really connect um, to, to sites like the African Burial Ground and trace some of these very early histories of Black and African presence in this land that we now know as New York City. So I'll turn it over to Brando for a moment to introduce the African Burial Ground, and then we'll share with you some of our stories. Hello, and thank you very much for joining today's program. For anyone who is unfamiliar with the African Burial Ground National Monument, the African Burial Ground is believed to be the resting place, the final resting place for over 15,000 individuals. Uh, it was discovered in 1991, and the National Park Service site offers an outdoor memorial where you can explore and visit. There's an inside visitor center with an exhibit, theater, introductory film. There's also artwork in the lobby of 290 Broadway. That's a Ted Wise Federal Building you see in this image here. 
And that artwork actually pays tribute to the enslaved and freed Africans buried underneath the streets of Manhattan. Today, we offer virtual programs. Um, we do live, we do events. We have special events uh, throughout the year. And when we talk about the history of Lower Manhattan and the ancestors who are buried at the African Buried by National Monument, they experience a very different Manhattan than what we know of today. Great, thanks, Brendo. And that's really where we want to start our story is um, even before this land becomes um, New Amsterdam and give us a sense of you know, what um, this area would have looked like. So what you see now um, is actually a photo illustration um, meant to depict the year 1609 and the land that we now know as Manhattan. So you might be picturing Manhattan today, right? It does not look um, the way we, we, what we see in this image now. Um, now the island, um, you know, in the 17th century would have been, um, you know, full of lush green vegetation and you know, oak and pine tree forests, as well as ponds and, and streams. And, you know, just to, to situate you to this image we have now, we're looking north um, you know, towards um, you know, the, the top of, of Manhattan. And in the bottom left of the image is the tip of what is today Manhattan. So to the left of the image would be what is now New Jersey. To the right of the image would be um, today's Brooklyn. And so we're looking at um, this land of lower Manhattan. And not um, depicted here as much um, is the terrain and the hills. Um, this land was not flat. Um, there were over 500 hills um, throughout this island. And that's actually um, you know, the indigenous name um, for, for this land is in reference to this terrain. So um, the original people who lived here on this island were the Lenape. Um, and Lenape means original people. They'd been living here, of course, for thousands of years before Europeans arrived. And they named the island Manahata. Uh, which means hilly island. Now, um, I, I'm curious to know um, from um, all of you who are, are with us today, I mean, what comes to mind when you think of Lower Manhattan, right? What associations, um, what connections, maybe what history? So feel free to let us know in the chat um, just what, what comes to mind when you think of this particular geography and this location. Now, um, the first non-Indigenous person to make this island their home uh, was a man named Juan Rodriguez. Now, Juan Rodriguez, um, he was a Black man from what today is known as the Dominican Republic. And he was a translator. Um, he was the son of an African father and a Portuguese, sorry, African mother and a Portuguese father. Um, and he arrives um, to this island um, with a, a Dutch merchant um, who had sailed here to survey the trading opportunities um, with the, the indigenous populations. So they arrive in 1613 and the merchant, the Dutch merchant leaves, but Juan Rodriguez stays um, and he marries into um, the Lenape community. He starts a family, um, you know, and this helps us um, understand the really the, the centrality of um, Black and um, African um, presence in what we now know as, as New York City and Manhattan. So I'm seeing some um, you know, connections that you're making to Lower Manhattan. Uh, Wall Street, right? Thinking about the finances of the city, um, the World Trade Center um, and 9-11, right? Thinking about the tragedies um, this land has experienced. So um, thank you for sharing some of those. And, you know, we, I think, hope through these, these stories um, to really understand some of the layers and the complexity um, that is held within this land that we now know as, as New York City. And, um, you know, even just in, in, in understanding the, um, you know, what we can about Juan Rodriguez and his, um, you know, life starting out here as a Black man in Manahata um, helps us kind of complicate ideas about, you know, how development started here and who was part of the founding of the, the city. So I am I'm now going to turn it over to Eliza to share a little bit more about the um, European and Dutch presence in this land and the building of New Amsterdam. Great. So as Kat said, 
you end up having the Dutch, who are the next big group of people who come here that are after Juan Rodriguez. And the Dutch will arrive in what Manhattan in 1624. They'll purchase the land from the Lenape and they'll change the name of the island to New Amsterdam. Now to build this colony that they want to see New Amsterdam thrive and be built into, they bring in enslaved individuals. And the company that's in charge of this colony, the Dutch West India Company, will actually bring in the first 11 enslaved individuals. And we actually know the names of these 11 individuals, which is extremely rare. And if you look on the right hand side of the screen, sorry, left hand side of the screen, you'll see the individual's names. And when you look at this, you kind of get a sense of where these people might have been from or places they might have lived, such as Paulo Angola. You also have Simon Congo. You even have a sense of maybe some languages they might speak, such as Anthony Portuguese. And so these enslaved individuals um, have diverse backgrounds that we can see just in their names. These individuals also really build the colony. And they, because of all this work that the Dutch need done, they're importing many, many Africans here to build the colony. And some of what they've built, we can kind of still see fragments of today in our city's geography, such as Wall Street. Uh, the enslaved individuals actually built a wall here to protect the colony. And today we can still see that in the street name, it's called Wall Street. Now, by the 1660s, there's roughly 250 Africans and African descendants who are, most of them who are enslaved, who are living in New Amsterdam. So they're making up a large portion of the individuals that are actually here in New Amsterdam. And we don't really talk about them often today, and that's because there's not a lot in the historical record uh, that people were talking about. And as we go back and we look at this historical record, we're seeing more and more evidence of these enslaved Africans and African descendants being here in New Amsterdam. And we're going to actually move on to the next slide, and Brando will talk about this, where we can see their evidence in the image. And so when we look at this image here, you may have seen this image before, perhaps it's in a textbook or documentary, and it's very easy to miss out on some important details with this image. So I'd like to actually take this moment to invite you, uh, the audience, whether you're watching this from YouTube or through the African Bureau National Monuments Facebook page, if you can go ahead and share with us what comes to mind when you see this image. What do you notice when you look at this image? And I'll give you a moment to write in your answer what comes to mind when you see this image of New Amsterdam. And so what you may see in this image, uh, you may see there's a lot of labor. There's uh, work being done by the enslaved individuals. They're not wearing any shirts. There's a lot of stress, perhaps on their shoulder or their head. And so when we look at this image and we see all that stress on those enslaved individuals, Someone's mentioning there's a lot of enslaved people, right? In the background, we see that. Towards the front, you'll see people who are presumably Dutch, all well-dressed, wearing fancy clothes. They have the fruits of the labor. They have crops in their hands. Maybe someone's carrying a basket. And what we look at closely, when we look at closely at the individuals in the background, the enslaved individuals, we see that they are doing a lot of work, a lot of labor, but that they also seem young. They seem young and capable to do work. So why did the Dutch want a young and capable workforce? And was this depiction done intentionally? Well, when the, when the enslaved individuals, when the enslaved individuals went to the Dutch and petitioned for freedom, the Dutch West India Company granted these individuals half or conditional freedom. And so what does it mean when we talk about half freedom or conditional freedom? Well, if we look at the next slide, uh, we can learn a little bit about the story of Pieter Santomé. And Pieter Santomé was one of those individuals who petitioned for half or conditional freedom. And 
individuals like Pietro San Tomé would be granted anywhere from two acres to 16 acres of land. They had the freedom to have a home, have a family, and actually create that family aspect in their piece of land. They were able to actually marry and have children and have their home in those two to 16 acres of land. However, land was very different back then. And so I'd like to share with you an image, a picture of a map of New Amsterdam in that time period. And so if we look at this image, we see that there's a barrier. You see New Amsterdam is basically anything that's towards the left of that barrier. And you see it's a growing city, it's developing, there's structures and homes. And that barrier, if you guess that barrier to be Wall Street, then you guess correctly. And these lands that were given to these individuals was actually outside the wall. And so why would these individuals be given land outside the wall and not inside the wall? That's the thing, it was meant to serve as a line of defense. In the case of Native American Lenape people wishing to come back into a colony and reclaim their land, those half freed or conditionally freed individuals were outside that wall of present day Wall Street guarding that land, more or less in the area that we're in today. And so this area where these half freed or conditionally freed people were guarding this land outside the colony is later known as the land of the Blacks. And my colleagues from the Tenement Museum can speak more about the land of the Blacks. Great, thanks, Brendo. And um, the uh, next image we'll look at gives um, kind of a, a slightly larger map um, and helping us understand the relationship of um, what Brenda was referencing of these farms and this land um, that was granted to um, people of African descent who had this status of conditional freedom in relationship to the New Amsterdam settlement. So there's a lot of detail on this map of what we're looking at. So let me talk um, you through it a little bit. Um, so what we see here is um, sort of modern day Manhattan up to 34th Street. Um, and in the lower um, left of the image is the um, sort of Dutch New Amsterdam settlement sort of south of the wall. Um, we see that historic map depicted there. And then um, between the, the New Amsterdam settlement and the beginning of this farmland um, is about a mile, right? So we see here where the map references the collect pond, um, that this land um, was undeveloped, um, it was north of the wall, and that there is some distance of about a mile. Now, beginning at modern day Canal Street um, up to um, what would be 34th Street, we see on this map it's listed as farms of liberated Africans, right? Now, um, this um, area, and we see it sort of shaded in with green, um, you know, following modern day Fifth Avenue around Washington Square Park, neighborhoods that we now know as Chinatown or Soho or the Lower East Side um, were developed as um, this, this farmland. And I think important to remember as well that, um, you know, some of these um, people who were enslaved by the Dutch West India Company would have helped to clear this land um, initially, right? We looked at that, that map, uh, the photo illustration at the very beginning of this very lush green island um, that people who were enslaved had to chop down trees, right? And clear this land for it to be um, sort of a European agricultural society, right? So keeping in mind that then this farmland that people are moving into, um, you know, they might have been familiar with that, that land already. Now um, I'm seeing um, some comments um, from some, some people, some questions coming in. So from Liz, why was it called Wall Street? So great question. Um, and maybe some of you have heard some clues already in what we've been talking about, but the um, where I'm sort of showing pointing now, um, there was actually a physical wall um, that divided the sort of official um, settlement and colony of New Amsterdam from the, the rest of the land. So that wall actually, um, the Wall Street was named after a, a physical barrier that existed. 
And um, there's a comment from Gabrielle that I think is, um, or Gabriel, um, that is very relevant that, um, so the, the people who were enslaved had a lot of rights um, for being enslaved even without half freedom. So I think this is important to take a moment to address because you know, we may have, have certain ideas of um, the ex ex enslavement and um, you know, what um, experiences of enslavement might have been. Um, the um, people who were enslaved by the Dutch West India Company, um, they were petitioning for um, their um, lives to improve. So petitioning for um, freedom and you know, um, petitioning for um, you know, wages that were owed. And this might set off a question for you when I say wages that were owed, right? Um, the system of enslavement under the Dutch West India Company, it was different, right? Than um, enslavement under later the British um, or what we might associate with um, you know, rural uh, enslavement on um, plantations in the South later on um, in the history of what becomes the United States. Um, but, um, you know, enslavement under the Dutch West India Company was different, right? Some people were paid um, wages. Um, people would um, have the, the right, um, you know, as enslaved individuals to um, sue in, in Dutch courts, right? Um, or to get married in the Dutch church. Um, and, you know, I think we need to be really clear, right, when thinking about this is that um, it doesn't mean that it was better, um, you know, uh, under being enslaved by the Dutch West India Company than, um, you know, for example, being enslaved by a, a British family later on. Um, and we can get a sense of how um, that's not a helpful distinction by just looking at how people are um, consistently petitioning the Dutch West India Company for their freedom. Right at different points in um, the history of New Amsterdam. So um, big question there and comment from Gabriel that is is really, I think, critical to understanding this. And, you know, I think the way many historians tend to see it, too, just one more note on this is that, um, you know, that it is different because these individuals are enslaved by the Dutch West India Company and by a company, right, by a business and not by a family or an individual, right? So thinking about who are the enslavers in um, this colonial settlement um, is, is also a key piece. And I encourage you all to do more research into to this history um, after this program and to learn more about it because it is often um, really less understood than and kind of the experiences of enslavement um, that happen later on in um, the history of, um, of the US. Now, um, coming back to this map, um, right? So um, this map, it, it um, is, is helping us understand, as Brenda was mentioning, um, how the farm settlements of people of African descent are um, sort of situated compared to the Dutch New Amsterdam settlement. So, um, you know, people who have the, these farms, um, they are the kind of northernmost part of the colonial development and therefore are a potential defense of the colony. So, you know, I think we can, can consider as well, the Dutch West India Company is, um, you know, getting a benefit out of this situation, right? That they are kind of, in giving this land to people of African descent, creating this defense for the colony. But um, the other piece of it is that people like Peter Santome, this land um, was a place to make a home um, for himself, um, for his family. And you know, over time, the Dutch West India Company, they grant about 30 parcels of these land um, um, and farm um, you know, um, plots to enslaved Africans. Um, as part of these people's petitions for freedom. So I wanna next take us to look at who else was receiving these land grants and how we can start to kind of people some of, of this land that we're looking at on this map. So this is um, first just a slightly more detailed map that shows us some streets that we might recognize today in New York City, Bowery and Houston. And um, you know, here we see um, numbered plots of farmland um, from one to 26. So this gives you a sense of you know, the different sizes of, of land, the order in which they were issued, and kind of the location, particularly within lower Manhattan. Um, 
And this map, um, I should mention too, um, was created by the Greenwich Village um, Society for Historic Preservation. Um, so, so they developed um, this to help us understand where um, kind of um, African people were holding land. So now to our list of um, to people who received these grants for farmland. So what we're looking at here is a list uh, that shows um, 30 people who received um, grants from the Dutch West India Company. So on the left, um, you'll see the column landowner, um, the acreage, um, how many acres they receive, and then the date that this grant was received. So highlighted here is um, a person who's listed on this document as Bastian Negro. Um, and we'll come back to him um, in a little bit. And um, he's someone that the Tenement Museum has done a little bit more research into because his land was very close to where the Tenement Museum stands today. So um, you might be noticing um, a lot of details in this, and I'd really be curious to, to know um, sort of what's standing out to you in particular about the people's names on this list. So what are you noticing? Um, what clues into people's identities or experiences are you seeing from reading this list of names? So I'll talk us through a little bit more here as you are, are looking and sharing your comments. So um, in the sort of size of land grants, we see the smallest um, plot issued is two acres. Um, the largest plot issued is um, 12 acres. So we see there is a range in how big of a plot of land people are receiving. Um, the dates, they range from the 1640s through the 1660s, right? So those of you who know your history here, um, you'll probably know that um, the uh, colony was taken over by the British in 1664. So there's about a 40 year period where New Amsterdam exists. And these land grants kind of span um, the, the last um, you know, 20 years of this colony's history. Now in 1663, Peter Stuyvesant, um, a name that many of you are probably familiar with, he was the last director general of New Amsterdam of this Dutch colony. And um, he um, described these plots um, in this particular area as having a house and a garden. So I think that description really helps us bring to life a little bit, um, you know, just what, what, you know, what were people, um, you know, living in, what kinds of structures, what was the land like? So, you know, imagine a sort of a house and a, a garden and what you will. So I see that we might have some, some comments coming in. So um, people are noticing widows, right? So this always makes me wonder, right? That the, the Dutch West India Company was granting land to women, right? So this is important, right? That the women and black women, women of African descent were receiving these land grants. Um, we see a comment that last names are the country of origin, right? And this is also really, really um, an area where historians have done a lot of work to try to understand better um, you know, how these names can help us understand potentially where people were born, um, you know, where they had passed through. And we see a lot of geography hinted at in these names. There's, um, and I think, you know, Eliza was mentioning this earlier, there's a mention of Angola, uh, you know, in, in numerous people's last names, Paula de Angola, Anna de Angola, Domingo Angola, um, we see Cartagena, uh, we see Spain, um, we see um, Portuguese referenced, Congo. So, um, you know, the people, particularly the first 11 who were, um, you know, enslaved by the Dutch West India Company and brought to this land, um, historians have used the term Atlantic Creoles to refer to kind of the way to think about people's identity um, as people who were enslaved in particularly early New Amsterdam, that in many cases, um, people who were um, enslaved here, they were not enslaved directly from Africa um, necessarily. And people had experiences um, in the Caribbean, um, you know, in um, European and African and Caribbean cultures and languages. Many of them were multilingual. Many of them have, would have had experience with um, European and Caribbean um, kind of legal systems. So, um, you know, you see that there are, um, 
you know, there's a lot to be learned um, and, and certainly a lot of questions that arise, right? Historians have done an immense amount of work to try to um, understand more about, um, you know, these people's identities and how they were carrying with them both, you know, African identities and identities that were built up over these different experiences that they had. So, I mean, just a couple of other notes that I'm seeing here um, that it says um, the word Negro a lot, right? So thinking about names that were um, given to people that referenced um, racial identity. And, you know, it might be, be interesting to note here too that the way um, that, you know, racial identity and enslavement um, were considered in New Amsterdam um, you know, initially, um, you know, the Dutch West India Company also enslaved um, people who um, were not of African descent, right? So they didn't exclusively enslave people of African descent. Um, you know, there were Native Americans or people of Spanish descent who were enslaved, and there wasn't um, the, you know, exact connection that we might be aware of um, from later history between, um, you know, African descent and Black racial identity and um, the, you know, um, what was determined, sort of predetermined to be, um, you know, a right to enslave people, right? And these racist ideologies that inform this. Um, that hardens over time though, right? And the Dutch West India Company does over time um, use race and racial identity as, um, you know, increasingly a justification for enslaving um, people of African descent. Um, so you see a couple of other questions um, that are coming in here. Um, explain, can we explain the acreage and how they determined who got two and who got 12? That's a great question. I don't actually know. Um, Brenda or Eliza, do you, um, do you have any sense of that? That's a really good question. I'm not entirely certain how exactly the Dutch West India Company decided who got what amount of acreage, but we'll definitely research that and get back to you. So thank you for the good question. Yeah, great question and area for, for further research. Um, so um, we see another question too from Joseph. Um, what did Angola or Congo mean back then? Um, so this is an area actually too where I am not as knowledgeable. Um, you know, um, I I will say from what um, I've understood from you know where the Tenant Museum has researched um, that many of the people who were um, enslaved um, from from Africa um, had origins and roots in um, nations in and you know um, societies in Western Africa. Um, so looking at at those connections. Um, but, you know, as far as the reference to the particular geographies and the terms Angola and Congo, um, that's not an area where I'm, um, you know, as, as knowledgeable. I'll turn it over to Eliza and Brando just for a moment to see if they have anything to chime in on there. So yeah, so the names generally come from either people associating with that or people associating them with those areas um, or the amount of pass through them, like you said earlier, Catherine. Um, so it's people's associations. I'm not entirely certain what they're looking at is the geography at those time periods, uh, but there are maps available online and people have different opinions, but we can send that to you, um, Joseph, if you like give your contact information to us and we can send that to you directly. Great, thanks, Eliza. <clears throat> yeah, no, I agree. And I just like to emphasize, I mean, these games are given names. When we talk about Pietro Santome, Santome, Santome is an island off the coast of Senegal. And so most of these are just because of geographic location. Um, so thanks, Eliza. Thanks, Brando. Um, and, you know, I, I'm seeing, too, some reference to, to someone thinking about the loss of African names and, you know, how that loss factors into some of these people's experiences, right? Um, and, you know, I think in, in uh, many cases, um, as Brenda was just saying, right, these are names given by um, the enslavers um, of the Dutch West India Company. Um, but there is some, some research and work that um, in particular historian Leslie Harris has done 
to really look at um, how these people understood, uh, you know, the, the power and the meaning of different connotations within names. So, you know, taking, um, having a Christian name, right? Um, if, you know, being um, Christian was sort of seen as a way um, out of slavery, um, right? Because essentially, initially, enslavement was seen as a way to, um, you know, convert um, people of African descent who didn't practice Christianity to Christianity. So if you have a Christian name, maybe that helps you, um, you know, gain your freedom or be um, more um, valuable. And, and that, you know, I think historian Leslie Harris makes the point that while people were often given names, um, they weren't unaware of what those, those meanings of those names might have have meant. Um, so, you know, really good questions. And I, I always feel like we could look at this for hours and really dig in and wonder and question and, and kind of, tr you know, bring to life in, in ways, um, you know, what we can learn from um, these names themselves. And I think just one more point to note here is that um, there's, you know, I think we see a, a diversity of experiences expressed within Black New Amsterdamers. And that in some ways foreshadows the diversity of Black New Yorkers today, right? Um, and the ethnic and cultural diversity um, that it is, you know, present in the 21st century. So, um, you know, the, um, as we saw on that map, these land grants, these people, um, you know, these land grants are near each other. Um, so we can also think about how relationships might have been forming with neighbors and that people of African descent in New Amsterdam, um, they're actually the most stable population within the colony. So I saw a question earlier about sort of, um, you know, the, the uh, size of the, the population of African descent, um, and, and even more than thinking about the size, I mean, New Amsterdam was a small colony to begin with. At its peak, it's only 1,500 people. Um, as Eliza said, the you know, population of people of African descent at their peak is 250 people. Um, so it's not a big population um, and people of African descent are not moving away in the same way that people of European um, heritage are. So they're a really stable population. And so people will be forming community, right? Um, and people who had the status of conditional freedom, um, as Brando mentioned, are the people who are, are then um, farming and living on this land. And it's important to think again, you know, as Brando noted, how, you know, this conditional freedom, it wasn't true freedom. Um, you know, they would be required to go back into bonded labor for the Dutch West India Company whenever the company called them. Um, they would owe a portion of, you know, their crops or their farm animals to the company each year. And, um, you know, we, we see that um, this conditional freedom and still has, you know, a lot of, of limitations um, to it. Now I'm seeing a, a many, many more questions coming in. Um, so let's just take a look and see um, you know, what we have. So how long did it usually take for people to get their, their farmland? Um, so that's a, a good question. And, you know, um, I think it differs, um, but I'll turn it over to Brando um, and Eliza actually for that question between sort of when the first 11 enslaved people arrived to when they received that first farmland. Yeah, so the first 11 enslaved individuals will petition for this half or conditional freedom about 20 years after they have arrived um, here in New Amsterdam. And that's when they end up getting this, which includes the farmland as part of being half or conditionally free. And that's roughly how it goes from then on. Usually the Dutch West India Company will give it to you after about 20 years of being enslaved by them. Um, there are exceptions to that. So it's just roughly 20 years. Great. Thanks, Eliza. So really good questions, um, you know, coming in from, from everyone. Um, and so the, um, the colonial records, you know, are, um, are primarily where um, historians have done this research. And in those colonial records, we can see um, some of these ways that people who were enslaved, um, but have this conditional freedom are participating in the wider New Netherland, New Amsterdam society. 
So, you know, we've, we've talked a little bit about how, um, you know, people could marry in the Dutch Reformed Church, but they could also sue in court. Um, you know, many of them um, did um, you know, eventually take um, Dutch names. Um, and for a period, too, people were able to get their children um, baptized in the Dutch Reformed Church. Um, the, the, the church would allow people um, of African descent to baptize their, their children. And this is for a short period, but this period is really helpful because it helps us then in those records see that um, people of African descent are serving as godparents for one another's children. And this is, is you know, starting to give us a sense then of these relationships between people, um, not only um, sort of formal relationships of godparents and, um, you know, um, husbands and wives, um, but also then maybe of some of these informal relationships and bonds um, of kinship that are, are forming among people. So at the Tenement Museum, I promised we would get back to um, Bastian, who's listed here. At the Tenement Museum, we've done more research into um, this person because his land is right near where the museum is um, today. And we actually, um, in the, the records of the Dutch West India Company, find his um, particular land grant. So this is, of course, typed up from an original. Um, and this, this reads GG200, patent to Bastian Negro. So we, Willem Kieft, so um, Willem Kieft was the director general of the colony um, in 1647. Um, so we, William Kieft, et cetera have given and granted to Bastian Negro a certain piece of land located on the island of Manhattan. Its length along the public wagon road is 200 paces and its breadth 300 paces with the express conditions, et cetera, done at Fort Amsterdam, 26th of March, 1647. So this is the record that we um, you know, found to, to then understand how um, large this plot of land was that he received, um, when he received it, and he appears on other records as well. So piecing those together has helped give us some clues into his life. So one record um, lists him not as best in Negro, but as Sebastian de Brito of Santo Domingo. So coming back to our um, conversation about names, right? What names appear on different records, right? And how do names, um, how are they changed? Um, and, you know, um, how do they help us understand, um, you know, people's, um, history before they come to New Amsterdam. So Santo Domingo, of course, in today's Dominican Republic, at this point, it would have been the colony, Spanish colony of Hispaniola. So he may have been born in or passed through um, that colony. And um, additionally, we learned that Sebastian is listed on some documents as the quote unquote captain of the Negroes, um, meaning, you know, he may have held a supervisory position of other people's work. Um, so that, you know, historians have, um, you know, interpreted in different ways that that could mean that he is supervising the work of people who were enslaved um, and that he held a leadership role um, certainly gives us a clue that he would probably be someone that people knew. Right. Now, the final clue that we have into his life is a marriage record um, from the Dutch Reformed Church showing that Sebastian marries um, an Angolan woman named Isabel Kisana in October of 1647. So he receives this land grant in March of 1647 and then by October is married. And unfortunately, we don't know if Isabel and Sebastian have children, um, but key piece that Brando mentioned about um, the experience of, of having the status of conditional freedom is that if Isabel and Sebastian did have children, um, their children would not have been extended the status of conditional freedom. Um, they would have been enslaved by the Just West India Company. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll move in a moment to talk a little bit more about that next generation. Um, but, you know, I think also, too, I'm seeing a lot of questions overall about um, you know, records and, and how we're learning things about this early history. It's, I think it's really also in critically important to keep in mind what our options are for learning about these people, right? 
we're learning about these people from court records, church records, um, records that are created and presented um, from white European perspectives. So when we're looking at this early history, we're missing the voices directly from um, Sebastian de Brito or Isabel Cassana or any of those other people listed on, on that um, you know, uh, document of land grants. So it's the work of historians to, to look at, at the records and to interpret and try to understand what we can about um, these people's experiences. Now, um, the um, you know story um, next will take us kind of back to that map and getting a fresh perspective after we've seen the names of the people who had land here and talked a little bit more about their experiences, kind of coming back to this map and thinking about you know what what are the connections between um, people who are farming this land sort of north of the settlement and the people who are in the, the settlement south of the wall. Um, so people like Sebastian de Brito and Peter Santome who have um, these farms, they um, would have been staying connected to um, the enslaved um, community who are working in sort of New Amsterdam proper. Um, you know, in many cases, um, people um, who have the, the farmland um, further north are providing sanctuary for people who are escaping enslavement. And, you know, especially because conditional and freedom didn't um, pass down generationally, it wasn't inherited by um, the children. If um, people had children, um, you, know, you know, those children would have been living and working in New Amsterdam. So, you know, families have mixed statuses um, of, of, you know, parents who have this conditional free status, um, children who are enslaved. And this is reinforcing the connections um, to this enslaved community um, further um, downtown. It also prevents people with conditional freedom from moving away, right? That would mean leaving your children. So, you know, I think we can, we can see, we've explored in different ways that while owning this land, it provides significant opportunity towards acquiring um, more personal autonomy or economic wealth. Um, it, also, you know, we can look at the ways that um, people are continuing to petition for additional freedoms for themselves, for their, their children, emancipated parents in some cases are even able to purchase the freedom of their children when they have enough resources. So, you know, we can start to look at some of the ways that, um, you know, parents of African descent in New Amsterdam are thinking about that next generation and about their future. So um, we'll turn it uh, back over now to uh, Eliza. Um, to, to talk us a little bit through that next generation. I did just notice though, um, comments coming in, making connections between sharecropping and conditional freedom and farms. I think that's a really, really important connection to be made, right? Between what we see um, in the 19th century and, um, you know, um, sharecropping and um, tenant farming and the ways in which, um, you know, even when laws are in place, um, that true freedom um, is not yet gained. So really, really important contemporary um, and, you know, um, other connections to be made there. So thank you so much for, for those comments, um, everyone who's chiming in. So I'll turn it over now to Eliza. So one of the second generation individuals that we know about is Solomon Santome. He's actually the second son of Peter Santome. And he is born enslaved, like we were talking about earlier, even though Peter Santome gets this half conditional freedom, that status does not translate onto his children. And that's true of Solomon. Now Solomon does end up ultimately being granted his freedom by the Dutch in 1664. And he's actually granted complete freedom because in 1664, that is when it transitions from the Dutch being in charge of New Amsterdam to the British coming over and taking control of the island. And they decide to name the island New York. And when that change is happening, the Dutch West India Company says to all half or conditionally free individuals, and other individuals that they would like to free, they say you're now all free. And so Solomon is one of those individuals freed at this time period by the Dutch. So New York from a very early time period actually has a relatively large free African population. 
And as part of this population, we don't see a whole lot of him in the historical record, but about 30 years later, we actually, after Solomon gains his freedom, we see that he creates a will. And I'd like everyone to take a moment and think about what do you want to put in your will? Maybe you've already written a will, maybe you're planning to write a will, but what matters to you? What do you want to pass on to your loved ones that are going to live beyond you to the next generation? Now, in the case of Solomon, he actually says, you know, when I pass away, I would like all that I own to go to my wife. Now, if my wife ends up getting married, what I would like is 50% of what I own goes to her, and then the other 50% will go to my four daughters. And so this is what he does, and we can see that in this historical record. You can read the will on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, it's kind of blown it up right underneath the words, you can actually see what we believe to be his signature. It's that backwards S that you see there. So many historians don't believe he's literate, but he did have the ability to have a will written, looking out for the next generation for his children. So here we can see kind of the family structure that's taking place in New Amsterdam with the Dutch um, being in charge during this time period. And at this point, I'll pass it back over to Catherine to talk a little bit more about this family structure that's going on at that time period. Um, and I can see there's a lot of questions coming in. So just give me a second and I'll answer a few of those. Um, so somebody asked about tracing their ancestors to the origins of the um, enslaved African and African descendant community at this time period. I know for the burial ground that we actually don't know. Um, we don't have the ability to trace who is related to the individuals that are buried here in this burial ground. Um, so somebody else is saying all freed you could have led with that um, not everybody is free the dutch doesn't free everybody they do free the people who are half or conditionally free but not everyone um and they choose a few other people also to free at this time period um would parents hide their children to avoid enslavement I haven't come across this in the historical record um, because the Dutch West India Company, although they do give these half or conditionally free individuals land outside of the city, they're still checking on these half or conditionally free individuals. And um, seeing what's going on, you know, you have to pay a tax as part of being half or conditionally free. Um, so they're going to make sure to collect those taxes. They're also requiring you to come work in the city whenever the Dutch need you to come work in the city. So you have the Dutch going up and telling them to come down and work for them. And um, they're also expected to protect the city as well. So the Dutch are constantly checking in on these half or conditionally free individuals, even though they are outside of the city. So it would have been really hard to have hidden this. Um, so again, I haven't seen the historical record, but it could have happened. And then, so somebody asked, why is Solomon's will in English? Um, and the reason that this would be in English is because at this time period, the Dutch have left in 1664. The British are now in charge of the colony. We're talking 30 years later. And in this time period, the Dutch have, um, there's still some Dutch spoken, but the British are really in control. They're running the colony and the will would be written in the official language of the colony, which is English. I think I answered everyone's questions at this point. Um, so I'll definitely turn it over to Catherine. Thank you. That's great. And thank you, everyone. Um, so many um, really um, relevant and important questions to think about. Um, and, you know, I um, just wanted to, to kind of bring us um, to our, our conclusion of um, this program um, with, um, you know, just a, a note about legacy and what we pass down to the next generation. Um, you know, I'm seeing a lot of the responses that were coming in about this question Eliza posed of what would we pass down? Um, what would we put in, in a will? Um, so we see money, um, you know, land, old artifacts. And, you know, I think it's, it's always really helpful when we look at history um, that is this far back and this far removed um, to connect these stories to our own stories and think about how they're similar or different um, and think about what within our family experiences, what we 
are passing down over generations, whether that's something material or um, you know, not material, right? Whether they're stories um, or um, parts of our culture. So, um, you know, these questions for the Tenement Museum are always really, really central to what we do. Um, and, you know, these stories that we look to have, have looked at today um, for the Tenement Museum, um, these help us remember that people of African descent, um, you know, they um, were migrants as well, um, as although we might not always think about, um, you know, enslavement as a form of migration, um, thinking about forced migration as um, part of the broader migration experiences within this land, um, and particularly within the land that we now know as the Lower East Side. So our stories at the Tenement Museum, they're never complete, right? We're always doing new research, um, you know, piecing new clues together from the historic records that we're finding, looking to new scholarship, um, to oral histories. We're connecting to cultural institutions like the African burial ground to better shape our understanding of, um, you know, the, the range of experiences uh, in this, this land um, and, you know, understand how these stories can shape all of us and shape future generations. So I mentioned before this, this research that I shared with um, you know, everyone today is part of a um, set of tours that the Tenement Museum will be launching this spring, a virtual tour as well as a walking tour. So please do stay connected to us. Um, and you know, we'll share some information towards the end of how you can do that. But um, we hope to see you again on a, a program connected to um, the Tenant Museum. So I'll turn it back over to um, African Burial Ground folks to share how you can stay connected to them. And then we will um, say good afternoon. Great. Um, so for the African Burial Ground, like Brando mentioned earlier, we have a visitor center that you can normally open and uh, that is normally open and you can visit. But due to COVID this year, it's a little different. And we have an outdoor memorial that's open um, and it opened in 2007. So we'd love to see you there. We also have future programming coming up. We'd love to have you join us for that, whether it's virtual or in person. Um, next month, we have Women History Month programs. In April, we'll have National Park Week. In May, we celebrate Pinkster, which is actually a Dutch holiday that was celebrated by the enslaved Africans and African community here in New York City. And during the time period of the African burial ground in June, we'll have Juneteenth and we have programs every month that we look forward to having you join us for. And on the next slide, you'll see our Facebook, Twitter, and social media um, and uh, Instagram, where you can keep in contact with us via our social media. So please keep in touch. You can also email our site. If you have any questions, we'd be happy to answer them. So thank you so much. And we hope you stay in touch. And just want to echo that as well um, from all of us. Um, we really do hope you stay in touch with both the Tenement Museum and the African Burial Ground National Monument um, in whatever way you wish. Um, I should say too, the Tenement Museum's website is tenement.org. I think that will be coming through into the chat um, as well as the African Burial Ground uh, National Monument website. So you can see all these events coming up, um, sign up for, for newsletters um, and stay connected to us. So thank you all for joining the conversation today. I really appreciate everyone um, taking time to ask such thoughtful questions and to really ask questions that help us dig deeper into um, the Black and African um, history of um, this land that we now know as New York City. So thank you again. Take care, everyone. Um, I hope you have a good rest of your day.